You are listening to Proof of Love with Tatiana Moroz, Dr. Stephanie Murphy, and Lauren Kasovitz. This show may contain adult content, language, and humor and is intended for mature audiences. If that's not you, please stop listening. Nothing you hear on Proof of Love is intended as financial advice, legal advice, therapy, or really anything other than entertainment. Please take everything that you hear with a grain of salt. Oh, and if you're hearing us on an affiliate network, the ideas and views expressed on this show are not necessarily those of the network that you're listening on or of any of the sponsors or affiliate products that you may hear about on the show. Now that that's squared away, let's start the show. Show me your heart. Like cryptocurrency, politics, economics, activism, or art? Then check out the Tatiana Show, where you can learn all about it in a fun and non-intimidating way, as if you're just hanging with friends. Go to the TatianaShow.com and listen now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Proof of Love. This is the show where you connect with people that are on the chain, off the chain, and everything in between. My name. We're is definitely Tatiana. off the chain. <laughs> My name is Tatiana Moroz. I'm a singer, songwriter, and activist. I have a company called Crypto Media Hub. I also do a lot of different stuff in the crypto space, as you may have heard me on the Tatiana show. But now we're doing a new show called Proof of Love. And unfortunately, we don't have Lauren Kasovitz joining us today. She started a new job, but she'll be back with us next time. And in the meantime, we do have Stephanie Murphy, our usual co-host. Hey, Stephanie. Hello there. I'm so excited to be here on Proof of Love. I'm Dr. Stephanie Murphy, and I've been talking about relationships on the internet for more than a decade. Awesome. Yes, you may have heard her on Sex and Science Hour, Pork Therapy, Free Talk Live, or Let's Talk Bitcoin, talking about more crypto stuff. Oh, thanks, Uh, Tatiana. You give a better bio than I do. I'm on it. I'm on the case. Uh, And we're really excited because we have one of our very best friends in the crypto space joining us today, Pamela Morgan. So welcome to the show, Pam. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here with you guys, and I am so excited about this podcast. I love the idea of proof of love, and it kind of feels like this is Uh, all of us talking, but now we're talking to a wider audience. So I'm really excited to be here. Absolutely. And before I go into sort of my impetus for having Pam on, and Pam actually has a little bit to do with the the starting of Proof of Love. Uh, She helped me go down my own personal journey. But Pam, for people who don't know about your work, um, obviously you're an attorney. You've written a book about crypto inheritance planning available on Amazon right now. If people want to go and check that out, Pamela Morgan. But Pam, really quick, can you just give us a background about how you got into crypto and a little bit about yourself? Sure. I got into crypto was I was speaking at a conference in Athens, Greece, and I heard another speaker talk about Bitcoin. And I was super interested and really, really excited about the idea of changing systems. I'm very interested in incentives and why people do what they do and, um, and how systems work and how we as people react to systems. And so that kind of easily lends itself to my fascination, armchair fascination, uh, with relationships and people and you know, kind of on a more personal level. From a career perspective, I started working full-time in Bitcoin and open blockchains in early 2014, and I've never looked back. It's the greatest decision I've ever made, and I love my life. Uh, I work with people that I want to work with. I work on projects that I want to work on, and it's just been a really amazing journey. My primary focus, as you mentioned, is inheritance planning. So uh, I'm very interested in answering the question, what happens to my crypto when something happens to me? And how do I make sure that my loved ones can inherit it without giving them the keys now and without trusting a third party to handle it for me? So it's kind of a balance between security and convenience. We know that relationships change over time. And so the people who, who you might want to trust your keys with today may not be the same people that you want to trust your keys with you know, five years from now. And so I think that there's a problem with giving keys to really anyone. So I'm very interested in how do we balance this and how do we create systems that will actually work for you and your loved ones, but still allow you to retain all the power. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think people are really resistant to thinking about this question even. Like, they don't want to think about what happens. They don't want to think about their own death. They don't want to think about what happens after their death. I've heard people, not crypto people, but just regular 
people who have money that they might want to pass on to their loved ones who say, I don't care what happens after I die. That's for you guys to sort out. <laughs> but you're kind of leaving your loved ones with a mess if you have that attitude. And, Absolutely. you know, if, if you care at all about, you know, your family or what happens after you die, then, you know, take a few minutes and get, get a plan together. It's not really that hard. And your book is really great at explaining how to do that. And you go through a step-by-step -step process to create like a good enough plan and then make it better later. And it's always better to have a plan that's good enough. Even if you're talking about just a regular self-written will, it's better than nothing, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I think so. Yeah. So you get to the better than nothing and then you refine it and maybe make it even better over time if you want to. And, uh, I actually narrated your audiobook, so I've had the pleasure of reading this book and learning all the stuff in it, and it's great. I mean, I think you should, I think everybody listening should check it out if you have any crypto and you also have a family or you have anyone you want to, to be able to use your crypto if you're not around anymore. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm actually really honored that, that you agreed to do the audiobook, and it's one of the, my favorite things. But oh, know, I learned I, a lot. <laughs> that's amazing. You know, that's really the goal of, of the book is to teach people and to actually make this process doable, right? When you start to think about inheritance planning, you're like, oh my gosh, this sounds huge. It sounds like it's going to take me a lot of time. I don't really know how to do it. And it sounds like it's going to be terrible. Like it's going to be an awful experience, right? And so I think that's why people don't really take the time to do it. And so my book and, and a lot of my work aims to take away that fear and, and break this down into bite-sized pieces, into small things that you can take one hour, you know, 60 minutes, and you can have something that's a start. You can actually have something that will be better than nothing, better than what you have now. And then you can take that 60 minutes and build on it and build on it and build. You know, the idea is not to attain perfection the first time you sit down and do it. That's an unrealistic goal. I feel like this is a good time to just say a quick thank you to our sponsor and then delve into the love stuff, right? Because um, I love Pam's work and I want us to stay alive and I want to touch on that sort of at the end as well. Um, but I don't want to forget about our wonderful sponsors. Uh, we got a new sponsor for the show, uh, Salt Lending, and they are pioneering ways for you to grow your business using your crypto holdings. So it's basically a crypto lending platform. And if you want to go check out um, saltlending.com slash Tatiana, you can see for yourself how salt can help. And uh, I'll get into that about midway through the show, a little bit more information on that. I have my Pamela book in front of me and it's looking at me saying you started, but you didn't finish. And I feel, <laughs> a certain, I feel a certain amount of guilt that I'm trying to sort of sweep under the rug. But talking of feelings, the reason why I really wanted to have Pam come on the show, and I was specifically excited about her, is Pamela has really helped me understand my own feelings. You know, I'm an artist. I have a relatively, not like the greatest family life coming up. And, and I think that I've always felt a little bit maybe alone and, and, and whatnot. And, and it's hard to get good guidance when you don't necessarily have it within your own home. And Stephanie, you've also actually been really amazing with this, but Pamela definitely started me down a lot of personal reflection journeys. And she's helped me a lot with, with doing some self-love stuff. And I really had wanted her originally to come on to the attachment theory episode because Pamela taught me about attachment theory, which to date is my favorite thing in relationships so far. And when I first started it out, I remember telling Pam a story about how I was trying to assert my boundaries that went so badly and so terribly. And I remember being hysterically crying on the phone and her comforting me, but in between laughing hysterically at how miserable and bad I was. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's well. sad. But can you tell the story? Like, is it funny now? <laughs> it was, it was just bad. It was this guy that I had met and I had been trying to like let him know that this wishy-washiness wasn't working for me and I did not express it in a way that would make me sound sane. <laughs> I just sounded like <laughs> a crazy angry person and it was, it didn't go very well. But that's the whole story. And Pam was just laughing with me really hard because what could we do, right? I mean, she was comforting me. She wasn't coldly laughing in my face, but it was, it was definitely funny and it's still funny now. Yeah, that's the best thing to come out of something like that is you get a funny story and you get some bonding with your friends, but I'm sorry that happened. Well, you know what? It was, it was a start of an important journey. So thank you, thank you Pam, for, for setting me on that. But I think that you have some other ways that we can also improve. Oh, well, I mean, it's my pleasure. And I, 
I don't think that there's any greater compliment than than to be able to help another human being like discover things about themselves. Like I think that's kind of why we're all on this planet. I mean, I think at least in part. And so um, yeah, I, I'm so I'm so honored that that I was able to help you. And I just want to clarify that I was not laughing at you. I was laughing um, with you and and commiserating because you know the first time that you try to assert yourself in a new way, it often doesn't go well. Like we're not perfect and we're not perfect, especially, you know, the first time we try to do something. And so it's kind of funny to watch our journey and it's kind of interesting to watch ourselves like learn something new and then try to apply it and then realize like, oh my gosh, either I didn't really get it or I can't really apply it. Or even though I know in my head I should be doing X, I'm actually doing Y. And I, I, I think that's kind of a delightful thing simultaneously it's not the greatest outcome but I think it's a delightful thing I think that's how humans are and and I think that it's fun to be able to enjoy and 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 laugh with our own humanity yeah I think that's sort of part of the reason for the show too you know what I mean I feel like if I can tell people about my pathetic stories then they will feel good about their own pathetic stories and then they'll venture out of their comfort zone because I think despite my challenges of getting better not that I'm like broken but you know what I mean like I'm at least wholeheartedly in it and I'm really easy to like get into it and then I can talk about it pretty easily whereas I think some people they won't try and they won't even talk about it and so I don't know I hope you guys you know appreciate my embarrassing stories <laughs> oh definitely it it is always you know you always get credit for trying and putting in the effort nobody's perfect we all have our past experiences that affect our lives but yeah as long as you're trying hey we're all on a journey together <laughs> yeah, exactly totally agree and i think hearing other people's stories give us permission to acknowledge who we are you know it's it's often when we hear a story that we can actually relate to that we're like oh my gosh like other people are going through the same thing that i'm going through and you feel less alone and you also feel more empowered to do something about it or at least that's the hope yeah i think of that as a little bit of an extension of music for me you know not in a, like just i think that when i take a bad experience and i put it into a song it's so fulfilling because then it takes a really really bad thing and it straight up magically turns it into a good thing and, and an undeniably good thing because if you can help a bunch of people then you know the net the net is positive i think yeah absolutely i think like a lot of people tatiana you're such a boss lady like you know you got your own business and you're like doing all this stuff in the crypto space and i think people see that and think like oh you're just like a boss but you're actually like a very sensitive artist you have like an artist soul and i really love that about you so i want to make sure that that comes through <laughs> Oh my God, I'm such a sissy. No. I made it down. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. So, okay, well, my so art wouldn't be good if I, if I was unfeeling. If I was, you know, there's like the two yeah. Tatiana's. There's bossy, ta well, there's probably more than one. Of course, yeah. <laughs> um, but there's the bossy one and then there's the little sensitive, sad soul. Aw. So, okay, Pam, tell us how you got interested in attachment theory and then tell us what the next step in the evolution was for you that you wanted to talk about on the show today. Yeah, I'd love to. So I was introduced to attachment theory by uh, my best friend, and they recommended uh, the book that you guys were talking about on the attachment theory uh, episode, which is called Attached. <laughs> and I read it, and I just felt like this giant light was shown upon like my relationships, and I was able to kind of see myself and and see kind of the people that I was drawn to and. Um, I was really able to to explore that, and it was just really like one of those life changing things for me. Um, it, it. Do you want to, without sharing the details? Do you want to go into like, did you do you have a specific attachment style that you identify with, or what what kind of relationships? How is it showing up for you in your relationships? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to share. So um, I believe that I'm secure, but I also believe that uh, that we kind of ebb and flow. You know, I think that we become, even, even secure people can have situations in their lives that cause them to kind of move more towards an anxious side or more towards the avoidant. Um, and, and for me, I recognized that I was often 
uh, attracting avoidant people. <laughs> as, as I think you guys mentioned on that episode, you know, secure people tend to uh, attract avoidant people often. And I was attracting avoidant people. And once I was able to kind of get my head around what is an avoidant person and like how do they generally um, behave, I was like, oh, this makes perfect sense. You know, these, these people in my life who are avoidant, their behavior now makes sense. Finally, right? Yes. I mean, it's such a light bulb when it when it happened. Sorry to interject, but no, please, yeah. The, but but that's the thing. It's like once you realize that this person isn't just behaving in this crazy erratic way, right? But they're actually they're actually behaving in response to their own style and their own things that are going on within them. Then it takes the pressure off of me. And it says like, oh, I'm not making this person behave in this way, right? They're behaving in this way because this is their style. And, and so you, you kind of have something to work with. And yeah, that's actually- easier not to take it personally, right? Because yeah. it's not necessarily about you. It's, you can understand that it's about that person and their past experiences and you didn't do anything wrong. And then when you, yeah. when you feel that way, you're liberated from getting out from under that shame and blame and thinking that you did something wrong and you need to change. Exactly. Well, and, and you remove yourself from that defensive position, right? It's, it's not like, oh, you know, I made this person do this or they're blaming me for it. And I, I don't have to defend myself because I realize that I didn't do anything wrong. Right. Yeah. And so then I'm free to look at them with compassionate eyes. I'm free to say, oh, well, what is this? Like, what is this behavior really about? And that kind of leads directly into um, this evolution, and I found this concept called uh, nonviolent communication. And I don't. Has anyone else heard of nonviolent communication? I yes. have, and I have rolled my eyes many a time. <laughs> I feel like NBC sounds good, but the people that talk about it make me annoyed because they think that all things can be solved with that, and they. I, I, there's a lot of things that I randomly hate about it and yet I haven't read anything about it. So I have a lot of preconceived notions that hopefully we can, we can dismantle today. Fantastic. Yes. So Tatiana, you've, you've heard about NVC and you've had some negative experiences with the, the purveyors, which I think is totally fair. We're going to talk more about that, I'm sure. But uh, I'm also familiar with it. I found out about NVC in, or nonviolent communication in 2008. And it was uh, introduced to me by a dear friend. And it actually, I would say it played a huge role in my life and I find it really valuable and useful. Um, But I also know what you mean, Tatiana, about like sometimes when people first hear about it, they get really excited and they're trying to adopt this new way of communicating. And sometimes it comes off like really awkward and not authentic, which is totally going against the goal of, of communication in general, right? If you're, if you seem like you're not being authentic or you're being fake, like someone's not going to listen to you and hear what you're saying. So obviously that's counterproductive. Um, So I just wanted to acknowledge that up front. It also feels like it takes away the objective wrongness of something that someone did. Like, sure, sometimes there's wiggle room and you can see it from both perspectives. But my impression of it is to just say like, oh, you could screw someone over. You just have to communicate it really nicely. (laughs) Or like this basically is wiping away their responsibility for doing something that is objectively crappy because they said it in a nice way and you're just completely wrong because you're getting mad even though you have an initial reason to be mad that was valid. But because they're throwing in some like gobbledygook words, now all of a sudden they're absolved of their trash. See, I'm getting mad at those people right now. And yet, well, one more thing. I'm sorry, I don't mean to hog it, but- Uh, A random thing that I noticed is one of my favorite things about Stephanie is her ability to resolve conflict and to decide about things. So I, again, am basically talking out of my butt. (laughs) (laughs) No, you're not. I I think your concerns are totally legitimate. And I understand, I think I understand where you're coming from, right? Like you, you don't want someone to get off the hook for doing something crappy or hurting someone else just because they phrase it in a magic way that like Bingo. involves them of responsibility. You want someone to take responsibility for what they've done, right? Like lawyer speak. Exactly. <laughs> Those little tricky bastards. Yeah. <laughs> well, so it's really interesting for me to hear you describe it in that way, because that is not at all what I think of when I think of NVC. So maybe, you know, I've, I've read a book about it and, I, and I'll talk about that in just a What's second. What's the book, but- by the way? 
it's it's very simple. It's called nonviolent nonviolent communication. Um, and by Marshall Rosenberg, right? Exactly by Marshall Rosenberg, and he uh, developed this this approach. And and according to the uh, ever accurate uh, Wikipedia, uh, Marshall Rosenberg developed this in the 1960s, and it's an approach to nonviolent living, which is why Tatiana, I thought you would be really really interested in this. Um, and NVC can also be called compassionate communication or collaborative communication. And I think that that has less uh, terrible connotations than NVC. I agree. Totally. Yeah. I've also heard people complain that they're saying, like, they hear the word nonviolent communication and then they think, well, are you saying I'm a violent communicator? I don't feel right. like I'm a violent communicator. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah, I think, I think, well, kind of like in the crypto space, right? We pick bad words for things like words that don't actually um, help us understand, but rather sometimes stand in the way of understanding. And I think nonviolent communication is the same way. I, I think that, you know, the term nonviolent communication does have a lot of connotations, but I think if you can get past that. So, so for me, th this book by Marshall Rosenberg, um, I read it. I will say that it is a difficult read. Um, I didn't love the way it was written, but I loved the information. And so I kept, I don't know if you guys have this experience, but when I really, really want to learn something, I just kind of can push through the, the writing style or the word choices because I felt like it was worth me learning these techniques. And I think I want to make a distinction now between learning these techniques and actually applying them. And Tatiana, I think what you were talking about earlier is like, you know, people trying to apply these techniques in an inauthentic way. And then also like your first time when you start applying these techniques, it's going to be awkward. <laughs> like it's kind of because it's so different than what we're used to. So actually, I think, Stephanie, do you want to kind of explain what NVC is or do you want me to do that? Because I feel like it's important for the audience to understand, like for us to have a, a central kind of uh, definition. Yeah, right. sure. I would like it if we both explain it in our own words and then however we talk about it is going to resonate with maybe half the audience and you'll cover the other half. <laughs> so Perfect. Good. And then I'll troll you guys. Yes, right. please. Yes. We want trolling. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, and I just want to say also, I actually listened to the audiobook of uh, Nonviolent Communication read by Marshall Rosenberg. Yeah. And um, I liked that better than the book, I think. I, oh. I understand what you mean. Um, but yeah, the audiobook was good because it was like, he's saying, he's saying these things in his own words. Right. And uh, uh, just to add to what you said, Pam, Marshall Rosenberg was attempting to mediate major conflicts that were kind of like generational things. Like he wanted to get like peace in the Middle East and yeah. he wanted to mediate these like racial conflicts in Detroit in the 1960s. Yes. And so he was like oh, taking wow. on these big challenges. And yeah, um, I think it was bigger than just interpersonal conflicts, but of course it applies to that too. And for me, the most useful thing I've found about nonviolent communication is using it when I talk to myself. Because we all have this ah. tendency to like beat up on ourselves, you know, like sometimes we talk to ourselves the way that we would, would not talk to our worst enemy, you yes. know? And for me, um, not only practicing it with myself, because when you practice with yourself, you don't worry about sounding stupid necessarily, right? <laughs> like you're, when you're talking out loud, but also like just, you know, I guess having compassion for myself, was really important. It was a really important thing that I got out of learning about nonviolent communication. And it has to start with that because it's really difficult to have compassion for other people if you don't have a lot of compassion for yourself. Now, what do I mean by that, right? <laughs> the first time I heard about this concept of having compassion or empathy for yourself, I was confused. I was like, what does that how do you even do that? Because you are yourself. So how can you get outside of yourself and then have compassion for yourself? Compassion is only something you can have for someone else. Well, no, that's not true. If you think of yourself as, as sort of like, you know, having maybe different parts or something, and one part of yourself feels one way, and then, you know, another part of yourself is trying to sort of understand that. 
it's about uh, it's about that. And it's really helpful to just start by practicing like naming your feelings, right? Naming our feelings is something that we don't often learn how to do. And so we we get to adulthood and we're like, oh, I feel crappy, but I'm not sure why, right? Why do I yes. feel so bad? Or why do I feel kind of anxious or like this sense of something's not right or I'm just not happy, but we can't put our finger on it. Well, nonviolent communication, I think, gives us a framework to understand, to name our feelings and to also connect them to reasons that we feel that way, which are needs. And what are needs? Needs are things that all human beings have. And it could be th needs, for, needs for things like air and water. Of course, there's like the basic survival needs. But as human beings, we're complex creatures and we need more than just air and water to actually thrive. We need things like friendship and connection and we need understanding. We need to be heard or listened to, right? And everybody has those needs. So we can all relate to each other because we all share that in common as human beings. And when someone, when someone else says, yeah, like I feel really, you know, disappointed or bummed out because I, I'm in this meeting and no one's listening to my ideas. I feel like I need to be, I want to be heard or something like that. You can kind of understand that because that's happened to you in the past too, guaranteed. And so when you're connecting with someone else, you're connecting over sharing that experience of being a human being and having needs that are sometimes met and sometimes not met. And when our needs are met, we feel good or positive or pleasant feelings. And when our needs are not met, we feel negative or um, unpleasant feelings. So I, I'm, I've been like all over the place, I guess, in my explanation of this, but I would say the core idea of nonviolent communication is that as human beings, we all have feelings and we feel certain feelings when our needs, which are universal to all humans, are either met or are not met. And we can connect our feelings, if we can identify a feeling in ourselves, we can connect our feelings to a need being either met or not. And then we can also make guesses about what's going on for other people if we want to connect with someone else and say, you know, oh, are you feeling this way because your need for this is not met? And then the other person can say, yeah, I am. That's exactly right. Or they can say, well, no, not quite. It's more like this. And then through that process of making empathy guesses, you can connect with someone else. And you can also use this process, of course, with yourself to uh, connect with yourself, understand yourself better, and give names to your feelings and, and needs. And that feels good when we can identify and clearly name and, and uh, give, give a, more of a form to what we're feeling. Absolutely. That was a great explanation, Stephanie. That was oh, magic. thank you. I, did, I want to listen back to it, but I didn't think it was I, that no, good. <laughs> I think it's really great. You know, I love that you brought up that there are universal human needs. And I think a lot of times we forget that, especially if we are engaged in conflict with someone. If someone mm -hmm. isn't behaving in a way that we want them to, or in a way that makes us angry, it's hard to recognize that for me, what what nonviolent communication has allowed me to do is recognize that when there's a conflict, the conflict is usually because that other person's needs aren't being met or my needs aren't being met. And so, as you said, if we can look at our feelings and say, okay, what is this feeling about? What need, what, what's happening within me that is causing me to feel this way? What need is not being met? And then how can I actually meet this? And I want to give you guys an example in my real, like in my real world, how I've, how I've applied this. Right. So in my last relationship, I, like many people, um, went out with my partner and we were having a great time and all was well. And then I had to, uh, to go home and do work. And I had, a, I had a meeting that I needed to go to. So I left and I went home and did work. And this was like an afternoon thing, like a Friday afternoon, right? So work stops at 2 p.m. on Fridays, right? 
<laughs> well, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> yeah, no, not not for me, but I feel like a lot of times for other people it does. But so well, it's know. interesting that you said I had to go home and do work, right? I think with NVC, maybe they would reframe that as like I chose to go home and do work. Yes, yes, they would, except that it wasn't really a, a choice that I made in the moment. I already had an obligation. I could have canceled, but um but, yeah, but you chose to keep your obligation yes. and not just flake out because you want to live with integrity or whatever, exactly. right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So uh, I, I I left the fun and went home and, and did the conference call and a few hours passed and I hadn't heard from uh, from my SO and I was like, oh, okay, you know, they're just like hanging out, whatever. And then some more time passed and I hadn't heard from them. And for whatever reason, I had this expectation that I was going to hear from them, which was completely unreasonable because I didn't say, hey, I want to hear from you. And I also didn't send any messages, right? So, but, so I'm Oh, you were just sitting and waiting for them to text or something. I, I, what, sort of, I mean, I was still doing work, but I was just noticing like, oh, another hour has passed by. Oh, they haven't sent any messages. You know how you kind of do that. Like I wasn't really Mm -hmm. obsessing about the fact that they hadn't sent the message. I was just noting it. And as time went by, I started to feel uncomfortable. And I was like, oh, what is this feeling? Like, what, what is this feeling that I'm having? Um, and I started thinking about like, well, why haven't they reached out to me, right? And so I sat there and I thought like, okay, am I upset that they're out having a good time? No, of course not. Why, why would I not want my, you know, someone I love to have, be having a good time? So obviously my feelings that I'm having right now are not about me being upset with them for going out and having a good time. So what is this about? And so NVC allowed me to say, okay, I'm having this uncomfortable feeling. What is this about? Oh, guess what? I was able to recognize that it was due to loneliness because I hadn't been out socializing and I hadn't connected with my friends and my family in a decent amount of time. Mm. I was spending all my time working. And so that feeling was trying to let me know that I had a need, which was connecting with other people that wasn't being met. I wasn't taking the time to do that. I wasn't prioritizing that. And so by going through the MVC process and actually recognizing like, okay, what is this about? I was able to recognize, oh my gosh, this is actually like my own loneliness. And so then I was able to reach out to friends and family and say, oh, hey, you know, can we hang out next week? Or can we have a video chat? And I immediately felt better after Mm. I did that. And I was able to recognize that it wasn't actually about the other person. It was about a need that wasn't being met in me. Wow, that's that's a cool story. So, okay, so just make it- skeptical. (laughs) Well, okay, hold on. I want to hear the skepticism. But first of all, just to break it down and make it really simple. So Pamela in the story identified that the feeling was loneliness. Is that right? Yes, yes. Okay, and it was connected to a need for- connection, right? That was missing and that was not being met. And so you felt this feeling of loneliness because you were missing connection with other loved ones. And then you went ahead and used a strategy, which was reaching out to some friends to make plans to talk or see each other. And that was a strategy to try to get your need met. And then when, once you felt the need being met, you felt relieved or better. Yes, that's exactly right. But all of the catalyst of all of this was the fact that, you know, my, my person was out and they were having fun and I wasn't, hmm. right? And so I was feeling badly about that. And so maybe before NVC or before, you know, maybe, maybe as a teenager, I would have been like, why didn't you call me? You know, <laughs> why didn't you reach out? Oh my God, you know, like that sort of stuff, which I try never ever to do that now because I'm an adult. Um, but you know, this, this, these, these feelings are there for a reason, but it's not necessarily the reason that the other person is doing something wrong. It could just be something as simple as you have a need that's not being met. Now, if you're you're trying to get away from that, from blame, shame, and shoulds, right? Yes. Those Those are things that NVC tries to avoid. So in this example that you gave, which is a great example, um, you could have said, the other person should have texted me. And then you're putting a should on them. And then you're kind of 
you know, not taking responsibility for your own feelings and figuring out, okay, what strategy could I use to get my needs met and feel better, right? Well, and it's also when you say you should have, that's making the other person powerful. That's saying, mm -hmm. I have no control over how I feel because you have to do X, Y, and Z in order for me to be okay. That's yeah, right. the position that I want to be in, right? It's yeah, not the it, other person's responsibility to psych psychically know what my needs are and get them met. It's my responsibility to figure out what my needs are and figure out what my strategies are for getting those needs met. Now that yeah, might and there are always yeah. multiple strategies for getting yes. needs met. That's that's another thing that's really important about NBC is that you want to avoid getting attached to one specific strategy to get your needs met, right? Because one strategy to get your need for connection met would have been if your partner had texted you, right? Or if your date had texted you, that would have been one way to get your need met, maybe, you know, for, for a little while anyway. Um, but it's not the only way to get your need met. So yes. you can think of other creative ways to get the same need met, which one of them that you found was reaching out to some friends and family, uh, you know, maybe Another thing that would have helped would be something like, uh, I don't know, recording a podcast. And maybe that would connect. Or her connect person you. could have just written and checked in like a normal person. I can't. I'm sorry, guys. You guys are sort of making sense. But why does she have to get her needs met from someone else? She was missing her significant other. No, like, but that's the point. That I wasn't. Person... That's the point. I wasn't actually missing my other, my significant other. The point is that the real problem was that I was feeling lonely. Now, there are a lot of strategies to be able to deal with loneliness. One would be, you know, my partner, but my partner is out doing something awesome. Do I want them to stop doing that and have to check in with me? No, because I don't want to have to do that with them right? So I'm not going to impose a rule that says, oh, you know, my expectation is that you're going to check in with me because I choose not to live my life that way. So for me- I don't think that's an unreasonable expectation. What I, is? I, like expecting that person to check in with you. I don't know. I don't think that that's so unusual, maybe in your personal dynamic. And, and then maybe that's like me having some need that's, this whole thing makes me so uncomfortable. I hate it. I hate <laughs> oh, it like passionately. Tatiana, do you think because that- well, because I think that it's saying that like, instead of that person meeting what I consider to be a generally accepted social construct, which would be to check in and to make sure that somebody's like cool and not like obsessively every single day, but just in general, like as a, like a, as a form, I don't see that to be so unusual. And I feel like it's asking Pam to and maybe in Pam's specific case, it was something more broad, but maybe she did want that confirmation from that person. Why can't she get that from that person if they're in a relationship together? Okay, well, she let's... could, but that's not the only way. That's not the only thing. Because That part I like. That part I think is more important, the ability to self-soothe. But I think that this is tagging. The thing that I hate about this is that it's, a, once again, taking away the responsibility from the other person, which to a certain extent is not theirs, but to a certain extent is theirs because they're in a relationship. Relationship means communicating. Um, so I'm going to give you some pushback on that. <laughs> um, so in, in this situation, so let me be clear. I'm not saying that I would be okay in a relationship where my partner generally wasn't communicative, communicative with me. Right. Um, when right. I, what the, the point that I was trying to make is that in this specific instance, in, for me and for the relationship that I was in, there was no reason for me to have the feelings that I was feeling it felt uncomfortable. And so I used NBC to explore those feelings of discomfort rather than immediately saying this person should have done whatever. I wanted to take that power back, right? Because when we rely on other people to do things that we haven't told them we want them to do, then that puts them in an impossible situation. And it puts me in a situation where I will always be disappointed. So for right, me, it's, a, it's making the other person responsible for your feelings instead of exactly. taking responsibility for your own feelings. But and if they're being yeah. a jerk, then sometimes but, they're responsible for it. Well, I, don't, I would say that pe other people are never responsible for our feelings. Yes, and this is great. Even though it's, it's uncomfortable sometimes, right? Because we want other people to act right, you know? <laughs> we want other people to be 
nice and so pro-social, I guess you could say, and to just generally not be a jerk, right? <laughs> it would be a lot easier if everybody did that. However, we own ourselves, right? There's, a, there's this idea of self-ownership that's so crucial to freedom and liberty and uh, you know, philosophy, right? We own ourselves, and that includes owning our feelings. And when yeah. we own our feelings, feeling is- that means that nobody can make us feel a certain way. Someone else's actions can trigger a strong reaction in us, right? They can trigger us to feel a certain way. But the point is that we are always responsible for, for our feelings. And that means that we can do something about it, right? Yeah. Well, then can either I- we leave. Message. But, but that's, that's the problem. Your only options are to tell them that you don't like it and hopefully they change or be leave. Those are literally the only two things that you have. Disagree. Because you, then that you, person can't like, uh, all right, go ahead. So, the, so there's two things I want to say. One, um, that is, those are not the only options. I will tell you guys um, on this podcast only that um, my mother is amazing. And she and her husband were married for 20 years miserably. And then they decided to go to couples counseling together. And they have been in therapy for the last 10 years. And they are amazing. They've learned how to communicate with one another. They've learned how to identify needs, their own needs, and then get their own needs met. They've done amazing work. And it has changed their entire relationship. And more importantly, it's changed their entire lives. They're much happier. So it's not just about like, oh, either you change or I'm leaving. Like those are are two those are two really hard positions to take. I think there is a middle ground. And I think if you have two people who are actually committed to living happy, conflict-free lives, then you can find a lot of strategies and a lot of ways to actually communicate your real needs. But I think like Stephanie said very early on, unless you can name your feelings, unless you know what you're actually feeling and you can explore your own needs, it's very difficult to communicate those needs with other people. The second yeah, and then wanna... also, I just want to break in with an yep. important point, which is that it's not like, okay, telling someone either you change or I'm going to leave. That's kind of like a, it is like a hard position to take. There's another way where you could explain to someone without blaming them or without putting any responsibility on them. Hey, I'm feeling lonely when you don't text me. And yes. I'm wondering if we can, you know, I'm wondering if you can hear me about that and maybe you'll be inspired to do something. So it's like you're inspiring them to change instead of sort of saying change or I'm out, you know, threatening them or punishing them. And I want to build on that um, because in NVC, like the idea is that instead of saying like you're a jerk because you didn't text, you say, I'm feeling lonely and I wonder if there's something we can do about that. And that's the connection. Now you and your partner have a problem you solve together instead of the problem being the partner, right? Instead of putting you two at odds, instead of putting you two in conflict, now you're working together to solve a problem. Yeah. And would you rather hear you did something wrong from your partner or would you rather hear I'm feeling lonely. And then you say, oh yeah, I understand what that's like. I have felt lonely before too. And then maybe you want to, because you like your partner, you want to help them not feel lonely. Exactly. Tatiana, I want to go back to, um, to this idea of like, sometimes people make you mad or like make people, other people mad. Um, and, and Marshall Rosenberg in that nonviolent communication book has this amazing example of how he was able to recognize that his own assumptions and his own experiences are what actually cause him to feel certain things. So I'm going to do my best. I might, I might butcher it a bit, but I'm going to do my best to kind of reiterate because I think it's an important point. So he talks about when he was working in this school and he was doing conflict resolution and some kids got in a fight and he went in to break it up and he got elbowed in the face. And he, I guess he had a bloody nose. It was really bad. And he was like, oh my gosh. And the kid who elbowed him in the face had been like a problem, you know, like a, like difficult, right? Um, He had, he had been kind of a, a challenging person. And so he remembered being like, oh, like, I'm so angry at this kid for elbowing me in the face. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next day, he goes back to the school and the school is like one where, where basically like 
there are fights every day, right? It's, it's, it's that kind of, that kind of school, which is why he's there. Um, so let me, let me back up a, a quick second and add something. So for on day one, he was like this kid, you know, he's, he's a problem kid. He's a jerk. He's self-centered. Like, I can't believe he, he hit me in the face and he was really angry at the kid for elbowing him in the face. Okay. Now fast forward next day, another fight, different kids. He goes to, he goes to break it up and he gets elbowed in the eye. Okay. And now he's injured. He's injured again. But this time, the kid who elbowed him was someone who was picked on. It was someone who was, had a lot of things going on in his life, and he knew what was going on with this kid. And so instead of feeling angry at the kid, he felt compassionate towards him. He recognized that like, oh, this is just a mistake. You know, he didn't mean to hit me. You know, and he was much, he was able, he felt different feelings. And so the point is that the same thing happened right? If you look at it on its face, he broke up a fight, he got elbowed in the face. And in one instance, he's furious. And in the other instance, he's compassionate. What's the difference? The difference is him. The difference is, 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 is him, his own feelings. The difference is his perspective on the situation. And it was that that allowed him to recognize that it isn't actually other people who make me feel a certain way, but it's my perspective on the situation. And, and that allowed him to recognize that he can take responsibility for his feelings. So I don't know if that's helpful or not, but that really resonated with me. I think that's a good story. I would like to kind of apply that, that thinking to an actual argument that's happening in real life. Cause it's easy to feel bad for a little kid. He's been beaten. You were like physically, <laughs> like there's a lot of physical elements in there that also make the anger sort of. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I hate talking about my own stuff. And so I'm oh, debating. Hold on Tatiana. <laughs> I want to hear the story and I definitely want to hear more of your concerns. Cause I think, I think Pam and I are excited and it's kind of like two on one and I want to hear your objections and concerns after this. Yeah, but, yeah. I am two on one, but I think <laughs> that this is good. These are, I'm, I'm getting tag team by two good, uh, good wrestlers. So. <laughs> but, but first we need to uh, acknowledge our sponsors, right? Yes. Let's take a second to talk about one of our sponsors, Salt. Salt is pioneering ways for you to grow your business using your crypto holdings. We've all heard people saying Bitcoin and other digital currencies can't support actual business. SALT is telling those same people to get real. A crypto-backed cash loan from SALT can turn possibility into reality by covering operating costs or a funding expansion. Don't let them tell you what your crypto can and can't do for your business. Go to saltlending.com slash Tatiana and see for yourself how SALT can help. That's saltlending.com slash Tatiana. So hope you guys go check it out. I'm going to do an interview with them on the Tatiana show. I just did one with Caleb, uh, who's also over there on the team. It's like a shorty. So check it out. But here I am bearing my soul. That's what proof of love is about. So I'm a little bit uncomfortable telling this story. So I'm going to try and gently because I'm trying not to get upset or let my own personal feelings influence my ability to try and see a situation objectively, even though I'm in the situation, I obviously think I'm right. So I have a person that they have a hard time texting me in a, in a reasonable way. And I find it to be very difficult. And so my assumption is, is that person doesn't care about me at all. Then when I end up talking to that person and we get into an argument about it, this theoretical situation, <laughs> um, <laughs> the person says, you know, I notice that they're really upset and they're like, you say that I don't love you and da, da 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 And here I am feeling very, very certain that they don't care about me because they don't text when I think that they should text. I don't know. I feel like there's something to be said for perhaps taking Pam's story and applying it to that person based on the clue at how mad they were, right? Because if they didn't care, then they wouldn't get that mad and they wouldn't get that upset. But at the same time, I do feel like that person's not reasonable. So where do you find that, that middle ground? Is, is the first part of the nonviolent communication to sort of make the assumption that that person is not coming at you from a negative place? Because I think that that might be it. It's like basically giving them the benefit of the doubt before you just demolish them as out to get you or, or where, like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm explaining this well enough, but hopefully I've given you guys enough clues to, to give some further color to what I'm, what I'm bringing up. 
I think you absolutely have. And I think one of the assumptions of NVC is that all human beings have the capacity for compassion and empathy. And that violence and like behavior that's harmful to others or like when, when, when you behave in a way that hurts other people are, are only an option when we don't see effective strategies, other effective strategies or more effective strategies for meeting our needs. And yeah, right. Everything that everyone does is always to meet needs. Yes. And so for, for that person who is not texting, which hurts Tatiana, I don't know exactly what their needs could be, but you know, maybe some guesses about that could be maybe they need solitude or maybe they need relaxation or rest and they're just not looking at their phone or something. Or maybe they need, they're needing like some comfort or ease and they feel uncomfortable about texting you for some reason because it's a heated conversation or something like that. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Or they're a jerk and they're selfish and they don't care. <laughs> right. So those are, those are all judgments about the person. And, you know, um, I, I'm curious, like, I think before we try to guess at the other person who's not texting at their needs, we should try to guess at Tatiana's needs, right? Yes. So it sounds like you feel you lonely guys. and frustrated and <laughs> annoyed, angry, you know, uh, confused maybe about why they're not texting. Is that any of those sound, sound right? Yeah, I mean, I think that in this situation, it's a little bit of a complicated situation because there's so much history there and Stephanie happens to have been there during this specific <laughs> thing that I'm thinking about. So it's a little bit of a, of a mix up. So I don't Well, also I don't sometimes know. I am the person who doesn't text, so I have compassion for them too. <laughs> yeah, I, I do that as well. So. God, you yeah. guys are so irresponsible. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, but I like the idea of exploring this because it's not, so, so is it really the fact that the person didn't text? Is that really the problem? I don't think it is. I think, I think that's a good question because I'll say this, that I don't always care about if this person or any person will text in a reasonable way. Yes. I feel like I want them to be mostly reliable and then there's a 10 to 20% range for like messing it up. As long as I know that most of the time that person is there and I feel like they're not going to be flaky and strange, then it doesn't bother me. But if it becomes a pattern, which probably means that's not a great person to begin with, that's when I think it becomes more difficult. But I wish that I could express that in a way that's not necessarily ballistic because I don't really think that it is endearing to hear about me being pissed about something in that way, even though I think I'm completely justified in being that furious. And that's the whole point of NVC is to give you the tools to be able to express your needs in a way that the other person can hear your yes. needs and then hopefully get your needs met, right? Yes, so because when you express, yeah. like you can express your needs in all different kinds of ways. Wait, like Tatiana, when you say, I want them to text in a reasonable time. Why is this so hard? I just don't get it. You know, like, why are they such an asshole? Right? Right. <laughs> you are expressing your needs. But for another person who isn't versed in NBC or just most other people, they're going to hear that and they're going to hear, oh, she's saying I'm doing something wrong. I don't like to hear that I'm doing something wrong. And then they're going to get defensive or tune out. They're not really going to be able to listen to you very easily, right? Unless they're like in some kind of NVC guru, maybe they would say, well, are you, it sounds like you're feeling upset and angry because you really want some reassurance or you want some communication or you, you're confused about what's going on. Right? Yeah, that's what I want them to say. Right. Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's hard. You know, not, not everybody has the tools to do that. Although, you know, it, um, the great thing about NVC is that if you're having a conflict with someone and only one person knows NVC, it's still really useful because like you can always use it with yourself and you can always use it with the other person. And when you know NVC, you don't have to take anything that someone else says personally. You can just yes. see the needs behind what they're saying, even if they're saying it in kind of a mean or harsh way that doesn't sound that great. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a great explanation. Some and wisdom also, on this podcast, you bastards. <laughs> <laughs> also, I want I I just out of curiosity sake, and you know, maybe we shouldn't put this on the podcast, but I, I would be curious to know how you're feeling about the relationship overall when you get upset 
when someone isn't texting. In other words, if you're feeling really solid in the relationship and you're feeling like everything is good, maybe your needs to have that text isn't actually there. In other words, maybe it's actually a need for reassurance in the relationship overall. Yeah. And Thank God, you're so smart. And, That's totally and, true. That's exactly but, why I cared about the text in that specific yes. situation because I didn't feel comfortable in where we were and I needed reassurance otherwise. And the text becomes the the marker as to where things are. And yes, it's, it's and maybe that's an unfair. I feel like that person feels pressured to send text messages and they don't like it. And I feel like they're being, once again, selfish and an a-hole, but maybe there's some way that I can look at it differently. Maybe they need to feel like they have autonomy. You know what I mean? But I don't think we can even get to that conversation because the initial meet, like it's all, all of this fury and like frustration and, and unspoken stuff is sort of confused. Yeah, but maybe it's because, so maybe instead of looking, you know, from their perspective first, I, I think it's really important to look at yourself first Your and say, okay, yeah. yeah, like what I need is reassurance in this relationship. How can I get that in a way that respects my partner's needs as well? Maybe, you know, so what are my options for getting reassurance, right? And it's not just a text message. So there is this whole, you know, host of things that you could do to get reassurance in the relationship. And if you're both working to the goal of, Tatiana feels secure in this relationship and person X also feels secure and good and like their needs are being met in this relationship, then you have way more options. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could give them like a whole palette of things that they can do to meet those needs, theoretically, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, first you start. have to name the needs and you have to yes. connect about the, about the feelings and needs that are involved. Exactly. You know, I think it's very scary to talk about your needs. You know what I mean? I think that's probably part of the reason. Like even having this conversation, it's very triggery. It makes everything about it makes me feel weak and loserish. And I bet you other people feel the same way. You know what I mean? Like nobody wants to say, hey, I need more attention because that just makes you feel like an idiot or like, hey, I need this thing. So I don't know, maybe just I think acknowledging the difficulty around that takes the pressure off of it a little bit. You know what I mean? And like, yeah, yeah I don't know. Uh, definitely because in our culture- there's a less self-judgment it, there. Yeah, absolutely. And those, where do those self-judgments come from? Well, they, I, think, I think they come from our culture where we're told that you shouldn't be needy, especially yeah. with Americans. It's like, it's a value to be, it's valued when someone is independent and they don't need anyone else. They can just- get everything they they need by themselves on a farm, you know, as they're the only tractor, you know, <laughs> right? And it's it's considered a virtue or a value to be very independent and to not need anything from anyone else. But of course, that's not true. You know, we all need things, not just when we're kids, but also when we're adults. And, and there's no shame in it. There's right. no shame in recognizing that you have needs. And I think the suppression of those needs and denying your own needs is what causes people to be so angry as we go back to the violence, right? And we go back to the anger and we go back to these strategies of, you know, of, of behaving in a way that's, that's not compassionate towards other people. You know, I think that all stems from failing to acknowledge what your needs are and failing to see them and then recognizing that, hey, guess what? They are actually valuable and it does matter if you're feeling bad and you should be able to you know, create strategies and figure out ways to make you make yourself feel better and not just deny. Right. And, you know, this is a great point about the word needs, right? Like when you say I have needs, it kind of can conjure up some images of like, you know, a man saying, come on, men have needs. Don't you want to have sex with me now? (laughs) Or, Or it brings up images of like, I'm needy, right? Like I'm a high maintenance partner because I'm very needy. I need all constant attention or something like that. And yes. if the word needs doesn't really feel good for you, you could say something else. You could say, I'm feeling lonely because I would like some connection or because I want some connection or I, I have a desire for this or something like that. You don't have to use the word needs, but it helps with, you know, understanding the concept behind NBC is that if, okay, we call these things needs, all human beings have them and therefore we can all relate to each other because 
we have something in common and we can connect about that. And feelings come from needs. So whatever you call them, like the concept is the same, but you don't have to use the word needs if that just sounds a little bit too needy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point. It's a little vulnerable, that one. Pam, did you want to say something? Because I, I wanted to come up with a counter to the rest of the story, so to speak. No, go right ahead. So when I expressed to this person during this magical argument that never happened, I swear, um, <laughs> I expressed to them that I was pissed that they hadn't texted. They come back with immediately saying that I'm far too emotionally needy. So to me, when somebody replies with something like that, it's very, very offensive and it's extremely dismissive. And so to me, yeah, that shuts down the, you. it shuts down the conversation immediately. So to apply NVC there seems like almost pointless because they don't care about your needs and they're saying F off. So in my opinion, that would be the place where you cannot any longer have a conversation, even though of course we struggled through it with terrible results. But you know, that would be the point where I'd be like, well, if you don't even care about my needs and you think I'm too emotionally needy, well, F you, I don't even want to talk to you at all because why would you even want to engage with somebody that they don't care about your needs? They say that your needs are invalid. Like, is that, is that a point of no return? Yeah. Well, I mean, the conversation started off kind of on the defensive, I think in the first place, because when you came to them, you said, I mean, I'm not blaming you for this, but when, in this when imaginary you, situation, <laughs> when you came to them at first, you said, I'm upset because you didn't text. And then that other person hears, oh, Tatiana thinks I did something wrong. And then immediately when they hear that, they start to get defensive and then they start formulating a response that's not really listening to you or how you feel or what you need, but it's about how can I prove that I didn't do something wrong, <laughs> right? Ah. Yes. And they're formulating a response to argue back, well, no, I didn't do something wrong. And then you formulate a response to say, well, yes, you did. Why aren't you listening to me, <laughs> right? And so then it just is like a downward spiral from there. But how could that conversation have gone differently if you had sort of taken a minute to reflect and say, you know, I'm, I'm feeling like kind of uneasy about this whole relationship. And yeah, I'm like, I'm mad that they didn't text, but also maybe there's something bigger going on here. Like, I'm just not, I'm just not really feeling the love that I need to really feel secure in this relationship. I think I'm going to talk to them about this. And if you had, if you had come to them and said, hey, you know, can I, can I talk to you? Like, I'm I'm just feeling kind of uneasy. I'm not, you know, I'm not really feeling uh I would like a, a greater I would like to feel a greater sense of security in this relationship. I'd like to spend more time together or something like that. If you had come to them with an approach like that, I wonder how it would have gone differently. Of course, they could still hear that as an accusation or they could still take it personally, but maybe there's a greater chance that they they wouldn't. And they would just say, oh yeah, okay, well, I, I understand that you feel that way, but I feel like I really need freedom and autonomy. So, you know, I, what can we do about this? I hate this, but I kind of agree with you, but I still am eye rolling because I feel like so much work to get somebody to do something so reasonable, which is to simply send a text. If and only they would just responses. text, right? Simply, yes. These are basic basic communication. I mean, I don't understand people that don't text. All right, I'm going off on a tangent. Hey, I'm yeah, that's the go. frustrating thing about other people. We can't I hate them as all. much as we want them. We, we, we might want to sometimes. Sometimes they just don't do what we want and it can be what a lot of work. What normal people should do is just text. <laughs> But that's, but, you know, that's the danger, right? If we're relying on other people to take some sort of action, then, and, and especially if we don't tell them exactly what we want in the moment that we want, it, it leads to disappointment. It leads to misunderstanding and disappointment. And Stephanie, I think you did an amazing job of, of exploring that whole, like, if you had approached it in a different way. And, and I think it's important to know that even though we're sitting here talking about this and we're like, okay, what could you have said? It does take effort. It does take yeah, like it's sitting. Hard. Yes. I and had like a whole day of fury building up. You yeah, guys have no idea how much less fury is. My yeah, but, 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 but let's look at the amount out. of time, but look at the amount of time that you spent being upset about it. And then compare that to the amount of time if you had known about NVC and you had tried to start learning about these strategies 
how much better things would be overall, right? Because you have to look at the opportunity cost of time and constantly like being disappointed and, and all of these True, sorts of things, good point. Right? And so it's actually worth your time, at least this is how I view these sorts of things. It's actually worth my time to spend time and try and learn these things and try to, you know, awkwardly apply them. And sometimes I fail miserably and sometimes I have to have very strange conversations. And sometimes I don't even know like why I'm feeling a certain way. So I'll say to a friend like, hey, I'm feeling really anxious today and I can't really figure out why. Can you talk it out with me? Like, do you have time to try and help me figure this out? And actually just, you know, have a chat about it and try and figure out what my needs are. But rather than going at them and being like, you're not a good friend. You didn't message me. Do you know if I can actually, like I said earlier, make it a shared goal, make it a shared problem that we can solve together. I feel like that changes the dynamic rather than me attacking the person for not meeting my expectations you know, recognizing that there's a need that hasn't been met and trying to frame it in a way that we can work together. Because really what matters at the end of the day is if your need is met. Mm. Whether or not the person texts is completely irrelevant. What matters is how you feel about the relationship. And so if you keep that goal in mind, it's much easier to reach that goal if you know what that goal is. This is a good place to talk about the idea of requests versus demands, right? Yes. This is another concept in nonviolent communication. And that is that a lot of times in our culture, people make demands of other people. So in this situation, um, you know, either of the stories that you ladies related, the demand, if you were going to make a demand, which would be really easy, you could just demand that your partner text me, right? Text me. (laughs) It's not that hard. Just text me. (laughs) So When people hear demands, though, a lot of times they tend to shut down and they say, well, no, I don't want to do that. Don't tell me what to do. You know, everybody's inner anarchist comes out and they're like, no, I don't want to do that. (laughs) But if you make a request that's preceded by some kind of connection, hey, you know, I'm feeling, or like Pamela's example, I'm feeling kind of like anxious or, you know, antsy and I'm not exactly sure why. Do you have time to talk with me about it and talk talk this out? You know, she's making a request of her friend and her friend knows that she's free to say no. That's the important thing about a request versus a demand. Yeah, and then you make them into the hero because now they're people naturally like to be helpful. I think they've done studies on that and now they're like, "Oh, well look at me." And then they end up coming out of it not like the villain, but like a person that solved a problem. Psychologically, I think that'd probably be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I I mean, I guess when you're communicating with someone and you want them to do what you want, um, ironically, the best way to get them to, you know, the best way to approach that situation is to make a request and not a demand, even though it's really tempting to make a demand, right? People just tend not to respond very well to demands. But the tricky part about that is that when you make a request, you have to be open to hearing no. And it it has to be okay for the other person to say no. Otherwise, they will pick up that it's not really a request. It's actually a demand. And then they'll get defensive and they'll dig their heels in and they won't want to meet your needs because then you're making a demand. Yeah. And also, um, I think you mentioned this earlier, Tatiana, but but it was like, you want them to, I'm going to use the text example, like you want them to text, but you want them to want to text. You don't yes. want them to text because you demanded that they text. You want them to want to text because they respect you and they want to be connected with you in the relationship. And so demands are problematic because even if someone meets your demand, they will do so with an air of, um, you won't get the connection. That you it's not really going to meet your needs, right? Exactly. Yes. Yes. That's exactly the point. Is no that- one wants to be browbeaten into that because then it's not even a, it's like you're getting something that you just force them into it. No one wants that. Right. So wouldn't it be better if that person understood how you feel and then they want to make sure that they're texting you every so often because they genuinely, you know, care about you feeling a sense of security, right? And so then yeah. they, then your need is really met because not only are they kind of, willing to do what you asked, which is text more often, but they're also understanding how you feel about it. And that's really important because it creates a sense of connection between you. Yes. And like Pam said, it's a problem that you're working on together. Yeah. Uh, So I've been able to apply this exact situation, this texting situation um, in my life with my mom. 
And, you know, you guys know that I travel a lot and I'm, I'm always on the road. And, you know, my, my mother gets a little nervous when she doesn't hear from me, but sometimes she doesn't, you know, sometimes life gets in the way and, and I don't send a message when I should. And so it used to be that she would just fester and she would, <laughs> she would just be worried and worried and worried, but she wouldn't send me a message and let me know. She would just like wait for me to, to spontaneously send her a message. And then when I would, she would be like, oh my gosh, I was so worried about you. And I felt like, well, wait a minute. I didn't know that you were worried. You know, I was going on with my life. I'm traveling. I'm doing all these things. Okay. I don't want you to be upset because I love you and I don't want you to worry about me. So what can we do? What are some strategies that we can implement so that your needs are met so that you're not worried, but also so that my needs are met and I'm not constantly like, oh my gosh, is my mom upset? Right? So what we chose to do is I send a message when I land. So if I'm, if I'm on a flight, I send a message when I, when I land at the airport. And then if she gets worried in the interim or in the meantime, she just sends me a message and says, Hey, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit worried. Do you think we can talk? And I'm like, Oh, of course we can, you know? And then normally within 12 hours or so, I send a message back and, and we schedule time to talk and all is well. I love that example because I have a similar situation. <laughs> I feel like I'm being ganged up on by two no. non-texters that are trying to change the <laughs> protocol. The protocol is text. <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing is, is that for me, it's really about finding a way to make it, to, to make sure that her needs are met, but also to recognize and protect my needs and my boundaries. And so it's not reasonable for me to say, you know, text her every other day. I just, I just can't do that. My lifestyle isn't, is, isn't, doesn't allow for that. But that doesn't mean that I don't love her. And that doesn't mean that I don't, you know, that I'm not going to be there for her, right? And so to open that, to open up the perspective and say that there are more ways that these needs can be met than just, you know, X, you have to text me every 48 hours, otherwise I'm going to be worried. For me, that's unreasonable. And so I had to find- That's a demand, right? Yes, it's a demand, yes. And, and that's exactly right. And so I had to find a way, a creative way to make it okay, to make what I need okay and also to make what she needs okay. And for us, it works awesome. It might not work for you. It might not work for everyone. But for us, for our needs, it works well. And I think that's an important point to make is like, not everyone, like not every solution is going to work for every person. And it's important for you to recognize, you know, what your needs actually are and say whether or not your needs are being met. For us, that strategy works. Yeah. And it, you know, it's amazing how when people are heard about how they feel and what they need, they become more open to different kinds of solutions, you yeah, know? Totally. I would agree with that 100%. Well, I think if I had approached that situation differently, I think that I would have had a different outcome. And I think that once you get into this heated thing, nobody's listening to anybody anymore at all. And it's unfortunate that things devolved in the way that they did. Because I don't like need to be texted every minute of every day or even be checked in. It's just, I think that there were some other underlying things that needed to be addressed. And had they been addressed more directly and more like gentle, I wouldn't have such an attachment to the text representation of, of someone's caring for me in that, in that specific case. You know what I mean? That didn't happen. Right. Yeah. It would have probably felt really good to be just listened to by that other person and have them be curious about what you were feeling, right? Oh, like, how, what, did you, what were you feeling when you noticed that I didn't text you? Tell me about that. What was going on? You know, wouldn't that feel good if someone was just like asking well, questions? Absolutely, because the entire time that I had this this really intense argument, I felt like this person didn't care about me. But if you think about it, well, then why would they have this huge argument? Would would they just like hang up and be like, I'm out of here? You know what I mean? Like to evoke such a like. I don't know. There's a really big disconnect with what I perceived versus what that person is feeling, and I think that that uh, man, you girls are getting me to come over to your NBC cult. <laughs> but I, think gonna, I, I, uh, I, I, I'm going to get the book on audio, uh, on audible. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to try and put it in. I think it's less annoying than I think. I'm still a little bit skeptical, but I think that there are a lot of really good points here. And hopefully for the skeptical people, 
I was their, I was their champion. Well, and also I, I think it's important to, to note, like with this theory and any theory, like learn about it, see what you can apply, see what part of it that you can apply that makes sense to you. And if something doesn't make sense to you, like you don't have to do it, <laughs> you know, again, about voluntariness matters, yes. right? And so you can take the pieces of each of these concepts, whether it's attachment theory, whether it's NVC, whatever it is, and look at it in little pieces and go, okay, what part of this might actually make my life better? What part of this could I actually use in my everyday to make me a happier person? And I think at the end of the day, that's what really matters is whether or not we're feeling happy, whether or not we're feeling fulfilled. I love, Stephanie, that you brought up the idea of curiosity because I think when we can shift our perspective to being curious about our own feelings and curious about other people's feelings, it allows you to explore those things in a way that isn't as scary, that isn't as vulnerable. And I, I think that that's really important. And I love the concept of curiosity. I'm always curious about my feelings. <laughs> when always? I'm, really? I am. I am. I'm always like, what is that about? Like, why am I feeling that way? Like, yeah. I just feel maybe, maybe not always, always about every feeling, you know, when I'm happy. Well, even when I'm happy, I'm like, why am I so happy? What, what's happening here? I, I'm at this point in, in my life where I'm very curious about feelings because you know, you talked earlier, we talked earlier about naming feelings. And when I grew up, you know, we didn't name feelings. And the goal- oh, Did anyone you know, name feelings oh in gosh. their childhood? No, I don't think anyone gets taught about I, that. I mean, I wish we did though. I don't because, think people name their feelings till after like the 70s or 80s. Period. <laughs> important though because you know once you are able to name your feelings and recognize them then you can actually do something about them but if you don't know what the thing is that you're feeling it's very difficult to to come to terms with it and accept it and 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 make things better the other thing that i learned you know when i was growing up is that negative feelings need to be removed immediately right like mm -hmm. if i'm feeling bad i better do something to get rid of this negative feeling right now and the problem with quick that, we need a distraction yes yes <laughs> it's not okay to just sit there and feel the way you feel yes right and be curious about why you're feeling the way you're feeling yeah. what is this about right and so when we immediately turn away and we go oh i feel badly i'm going to distract myself we cheat ourselves out of the opportunity to do something different we cheat ourselves out of the opportunity to actually learn more about ourselves and learn more about our needs and learn more about our feelings. And the benefit of spending time doing that is that we have a better chance of getting our needs met. Absolutely. And also, if you're not persuaded by that, um, <laughs> when we distract ourselves from feeling something, the feeling tends to come back later. Yes. And it can really creep up on us in a way that doesn't feel so good, right? So in, unless you kind of get curious about those feelings and address them somehow, they're going to they're gonna pop back up. <laughs> so you got to do something about it. Yeah. Well, it sounds like this is an ongoing personal growth thing that people are going to have to work on. It's going to be yes. a work in progress. Very difficult. Until they die, and it. then they can get Pam's book, but they should get it before they die. <laughs> well it done. It only works if you read it before you pass away. <laughs> yes, that is correct. Yeah, osmosis does not, does not work. You actually Yeah, you can't be arranging your crypto from the afterlife here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is no smart contracts that are going to do that for you, folks. Um, okay, so Pam, tell us. This has been an awesome show. Thank you so much for coming on. And thank oh, you, thank Tatiana, you. for your questions and your curiosity and your openness to hearing about this. Uh, where can people find out more about Pam and about the things that we talked about on the show? Well, you can find out more about me at empoweredlaw.com, E-M-P-O-W-E-R-E-D-L-A-W.com. Um, you can find me on crypto Twitter at PamelaJD, P-A-M-E-L-A-W-J-D. And you, know, you can find out more about nonviolent communication by taking a look at uh, Marshall Rosenberg's book, Nonviolent Communication. And uh, I would definitely think about doing the audiobook version. Uh, the, the text version is a little bit hard, but um, Stephanie, I think you said that the, that the audiobook version is great. And I, I think I, I'm actually going to check it out again in audiobook version so that I can hear Marshall Rosenberg 
uh, explain how he's been able to to use these techniques. Yeah, and about. then one more uh, one more th resource that I want to suggest. There's a great thing if books are not your thing. If you kind of prefer bite-sized email kind of lessons, there's a great resource called the Compassion Course from the New York Center for Nonviolent Communication. It's called NYC NBC, and Ooh. you can sign up for their emails, and you can get weekly email lessons over the course of a year or something like that emailed to you that teach you NBC gradually and give you practice exercises. So I definitely recommend that. I took it a couple of years ago and um, I thought it was great. Oh, I'm nice. so doing that. Cool, awesome. cool. Well, we can, uh, I'll gather some links uh, for the show notes. Yeah, Fantastic. we'll put them in the show notes and people can check it out. Um, any final words, ladies, before I wrap this puppy up? All I no, wrap the is, puppy. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. All I want to do is tell people that, you know, if, if, if books aren't your thing, but, you know, you do have good relationships and, and loved ones and you want to do crypto asset inheritance planning, I actually have a bunch of free resources on my website, including a letter to loved ones that you can take 30 to 60 minutes, sit down and write a letter to your loved ones and increase their chances of being able to in, inherit your crypto assets if something happens to you. So it's totally free. I encourage you to go and take a look, download the template, make it your own. And, um, and yeah, make sure that your loved ones will be able to, to get those assets if and when something happens to you. Yeah, you need to give them proof of your love by giving them your private keys when you're dead. Um, <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Thank you to our sponsor, Salt, for sponsoring the show. This is awesome. If you want to check out more episodes of the podcast, you can go to proofoflovecast.com. Give us a like on, uh, I don't know, social media. We're on all the things, Proof of Love Cast. You can go to iTunes, leave us a review. Most importantly, tell a friend. This is a new show. We've been getting a lot of listeners, but we want to open up a lot of hearts. And this is actually a great way for you to connect with people that are not necessarily, you know, politically related to you or uh, crypto related to you. This is just for regular relationships. And we're hoping to bridge the gap uh, for everybody and bring us all onto the chain. Uh, I love you all. I'll see you all soon. Uh, go check out um, the TatianaShow.com for other kinds of content. Uh, check out Stephanie on Let's Talk Bitcoin. And uh, I don't know. We'll see you all later. Take care. Bye. Show me your heart. for listening to Proof of Love. Please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Proof of Lovecast. More episodes can be found at proofoflovecast.com. And make sure you leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends. Proof of Love has been brought to you by CryptoMediaHub.com, a boutique marketing and PR agency for Bitcoin and beyond.